I was starting in the book of Philippians, I, I wanted to go back and, and get some context for what the Apostle Paul was talking about. And we're going to get to let this mind be in you. But before we get there, we got to go back at the beginning. The, uh, the, the church at, at Philippi was one of Paul's very earliest churches. It was, it was one of the first places he went and planted a church. And uh, it's interesting that the, the little city or little town of Philippi was actually a, a community that was made up. There were a lot of uh, retired uh, Roman soldiers living in that area. Mm-hmm. And so the entire community was, was uh, very uh, patriotic. They were... They were families, or men and families of men, that had that had served Rome and uh, fought for Rome, and 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 so the the entire community uh, had a sense of of great patriotism towards Rome, mm-hmm. and the the uh, we we know that that the Roman Empire was sort of like the, it literally was, had spread almost around the known world. And uh, the, the, the Roman Empire sort of was the, like the, the uh, uh, it was the, the, uh, the highest that man could go. It was like the celebration of humanity. It, it, it was very much into humanism because because the Roman Empire was sort of built on the concept of what could happen when man would come together and, and man would, would, would uh, band together and form unity and how, how the human race could accomplish such great things. And, and a lot of the, 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 the most uh, recent technology of the day was sort of invented or, or made up of the Roman Empire. Now, the Roman Empire had actually was not the first empire to control the known world. I mean, it went, it went back to the Babylonian Empire and the Assyrians, and and then there was the the uh, Medes and Persians that had conquered the Babylon Babylonian Empire, and then the Greeks had conquered the Medes and the Persians, and and so the Roman Empire was uh, was sort of the like the the current. Uh, Group that was sort of in charge of the world, and and it, it really represented this i this idea, this ideology that that man could accomplish almost anything on his own, and so the the people of Philippi were really strong proponents of that. They were they were men that had literally given their life to that idea. They had served Rome. And uh, most, a lot of them had retired from that, and so there was a strong sense of, of that kind of patriotism. It was more than just patriotism towards the Roman Empire. It was, it was patriotism or, a, or a, a, an agreement of, of humanity, of humanism. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, a lot of times we think that we invented humanism in our generation, my generation. We feel like, oh, the, we're, we're dealing with stuff that is brand new. It's never been dealt with we, before. Well, actually, everything that we're dealing with today has been dealt with before many, many times. History has this way of just repeating itself, largely because we don't learn from history very well. And uh, so because, because humans don't learn from history, we have to repeat it. And if you, when you read the Bible, you'll see the same, the same things that were being dealt with in the Old Testament 6,000 years ago. We're dealing with those same things today. And uh, so the church, at, the, 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 this little church in Philippi, which this letter, the Philippians that Paul was writing to, that was where this church was planted, right in the middle of that sort of ideology that man can do whatever man sets his mind to. And that all we need to do is come together and and there was a, in the in the Roman Empire, 
there was very, very little sense of God. Now, they had a lot of gods. They had a lot of false worship. It, it, it was a... a, a, a the, the, it was this idea that every, you could believe whatever you wanted to believe as long as as long as you were in favor of Rome, as long as your beliefs, your religious beliefs, didn't interfere with the 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 political and the, the government of Rome, you could hold whatever beliefs you wanted. And, mm -hmm. and in fact, it was sort of encouraged. It was encouraged to, to, to you, you, can, you can be whatever you want to be as long as it doesn't interfere with Rome. Mm -hmm. And uh, sounds a lot like 2021. Right. <laughs> because we, right. we see the same spirits operating today. Mm -hmm. yes. And yes. really, when you look at history, pretty soon you begin to realize that that's really what is operating behind all the events that are taking place when you read the news or you listen to the news or when you when you uh, see what's going on in the world today and then you realize well this same stuff was happening you know decades and centuries ago mm -hmm. really what's operating is there were it's it's all comes from the spirit realm and so the same spirits that were operating in the little community of Philippi are still operating today and so the things that Paul was addressing are the very same things that we need to address today. They were the same problems because they were fighting against the same, same spirit. spirit. Yeah. And, and really, if you wanted to boil it down to its essence, really what it comes down to is comes down to the, the battle between uh, God and man. Hmm. The, the, the philosophy of godliness and humanism. Humanism is simply the belief that, that, that mankind, the human race, is its own God. It's as high as you can go. It's like, it's like and, and that's, the, that's what is promoted in humanism, and that's what a lot of these people around this little tiny church that was, that was fighting for its existence in this little community of Philippi and Paul was writing to that group of people. He had planted that church right in one of the darkest places where humanism was the strongest. Mm. And, and the difference between, between what Paul was preaching and humanism is, is 180 degrees different. <clears throat> because humanism is the belief that man is supreme. Mm. And Christianity, the belief in Jesus, is that God is supreme. Mm -hmm. And that we need to come into agreement, into alignment with what God is, is, is saying. And uh, so Paul started out his letter and uh, he addressed the fact that as he was writing this letter, he was in prison. And one of the interesting things that Paul said early on was, was he said, he told the, he said, I'm not sure if I'm going to survive. I'm not sure if I'm physically going to live. And he said, uh, let's see if I can find it. He says verse 19 in chapter 1, For I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. Mm. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now as always Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life mm. or by death. He said, for me to live is Christ mm. and to die is gain. For if I'm to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? Mm -hmm. I do not know. I think I can appreciate what the Apostle Paul was dealing with a little bit. Sorry. Because I actually kind of feel torn today. Because right now in a hospital room, part of me is dying. Mm -hmm. Our good friend Sue is maybe already with Jesus. We don't know. She's uh, 
The doctors have only given her a few hours to live. She's full of cancer. She's no longer taking treatment. And so for the last two or three days, my spirit, because, because there's a part of me that's connected to Sue. I've only known Sue for about a year and a half. But somehow, like with all of you that are here, there was, there's a, there was a connection that happened in this living room yes. with her. Mm -hmm. and, and she became part of us. Mm -hmm. And she became part of me. And today I feel like my spirit is, is wanting to go to that hospital room. It's wanting to go be with her. Not because I'm worried about her. Not because I'm fearful what, about what's going to happen to her. But there's just a part of my spirit that that is sort of longing to be with her right now because she's, she's my sister. Mm -hmm. And her spirit and my spirit are connection, not in some perverted thing. It's just, it's just a spiritual connection. Mm -hmm. She's my sister. Mm -hmm. She's my friend. She's, she, she actually she became part of me, and I became part of her. And so, so I was, all week long I've been, I've been like torn between rejoicing with her because she's soon going to be with Jesus. And there's a part of me that wants to be with Jesus. So mm -hmm. there's a part of me that, that just is longing to be with her and to, to, to sort of vicariously go through this experience with her, for, for my spirit to be with her spirit. And I'm not talking about my own passing, but I'm talking about as she goes through this process, I... I there's a part of me that almost wants to pause and, and to sort of just take a break from, from things for a little while to, to experience this part of life, this, this, this dear saint going home to be with Jesus. And so, so part of my spirit, I'll be honest with you, is, in, is there today. Mm -hmm. And there's a part of me that actually, like, I, I just... I almost, I almost di didn't want to do anything else today. I just wanted to sit and sort of, mm -hmm. sort of be. I, I, you understand what I'm saying? I wanted to yeah. be there with her, mm -hmm. and I can't physically be there. I understand that, but my spirit can be there, and mm -hmm. and, and so I, I just sort of wanted to, to almost do that, and and that's where the apostle Paul was here because he was in prison, and he didn't know if he was going to live or die. He was. In fact, he said, he said, I'm not sure which way I'm going to go. He mm -hmm. said, I'm not sure if God's going to bring me out of this prison alive or whether I'm going to die in this prison. He was ready to go home. In fact, the, the really interesting thing here is he said, for me to die is gain. He said, I, he said there's a part of me that would rather <clears throat> die because that would be an advantage for me. I would be at home with Jesus. I would get to I would get to go to heaven. I would he wasn't he didn't say he'd get to escape earth. He was saying I would get to go home to be with Jesus. Now, I will tell you this, there are times when when sometimes I've wanted to escape earth, but that's not what I'm talking about today. I'm talking about wanting to go home to be with Jesus, to be with my best friend, to be with the love of my life. Mm -hmm. The the one whose face I long to see more than anything else in the world. Mm -hmm. To be with him today would just be an awesome thing. Oh, yeah. And I have to tell you I can't wait for that day. Not because I want to get away from what's going on here on earth, but because I want to see Jesus. I want to be with him. I want to look in his face. I, want, I, I, I thought about that song, I Can Only Imagine. And I can only imagine what it'll be like on that day. And so, so there's a part of me that, that almost wants to be with Sue today because of that. To, 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 to experience it with it. Heidi got to go up and see her. Alice got to spend some time with her this week in, in the hospital room. And both of them said it was just so peaceful. It was so, it was so quiet because she is ready to see Jesus. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the Apostle Paul was there. He said, I would just as soon not come out of this prison. I would just as soon go home to be with Jesus. He said, that would be better for me. But he said, for me to live is also Christ. Mm -hmm. 
Now it's interesting, you know, we think, we think that dying is almost a form of punishment. <laughs> that it's almost like, a, uh, like that would, that's the thing that, that, that we want to avoid more than anything else in the world. The Apostle Paul was the opposite. He said, I would rather die than live. Mm -hmm. But he said, because I feel like God has some things for me to do yet, mm -hmm. I would also like to live. So he was torn between the two. And I feel the very same thing today in this room, and I'll explain to you why. is because part of us that knew Sue, and there's a whole group of you here, new, new, there's, there's a bunch of new people here today that didn't even know her. Mm -hmm. Some of you never met her. Some of you only met her once or twice, and you didn't really know her. And so you don't have any real any connection with her per se, and as much as there's a spirit of, of wanting to be there, there's also a spirit of life in this room. Mm -hmm. So there's two things going on here today. There's this, there's this spirit of, of, of that, but there's also this spirit of new life. Yes. Because there's a resurrection taking place. Mm -hmm. In this room, there's a portal that's open from heaven today, and the presence of God is in this room. And there's something going on here today. There's a, there's a new spirit in this room that's flowing through this room. And God is getting ready to do something miraculous. He's getting ready to pour his power out. And as much as we live in the same kind of a community that the church at Philippi was living in, we live in that type of an environment today. The, 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 the humanistic philosophy seems to be just taking over. It seems to be running rampant. And it feels like we're losing, and it feels like we're being overrun. But the truth is that God is getting ready to unleash the greatest move that we've ever seen. Mm -hmm. And we are getting ready to witness a great harvest. We're getting ready to see a revival of God's Yay. love and God's power pour through this world. And the very, the very carriers, the very uh, people they're going to carry that are sitting in this room yes. today. And so not only I, I have this, this t torn feeling between wanting to be in this hospital room where, where a life is going to be with Jesus and wanting to be here with you today because you're the future. Mm -hmm. You are what God is doing. Yes. And God is pouring out his spirit. He is pouring out his spirit on young people today. Mm -hmm. And there are, there are miracles waiting to happen in this room yes. right now. Yes. There, are, there are people that are going to become healers. And, and people that are going to be uh, able to cast out demons. The same spirit that Jesus <laughs> gave his disciples when he sent them out. And he said, when you go out, you are going to have authority over, over demons. And you're going to have authority to heal people. There are people in this room that that's going to happen yeah, today right. there are there are people that need healing today and there are people that are sitting here that are going to perform those miracles of healing that's what's going on today god is getting ready to pour out his spirit and that's where the apostle paul was when he wrote this letter he was sitting in a prison in a prison he was trapped and even in prison, he said, thank God I'm in this prison because while I'm here, I've been able to witness to the guards that are, are assigned to me. And the guards had a rotating thing that they had, to, they had to watch over him. It was sort of like a house arrest kind of a deal. It wasn't a prison with bars. It was literally a home that Paul actually could rent. But he was under guard. And because he was under guard, the Roman guards had to keep watch over him. And they had a rotating schedule. And so each, every day, a different guard or a different group of guards would come and sit and have to sit and watch Paul. So when, he, when they would come in, he didn't have anything to do except tell them about Jesus. And so that's what he would do. So he got to witness to the entire palace. He got to witness to the entire garrison of soldiers that were sent to guard him. They thought they were guarding him. He was there to evangelize them. Oh, and amen. so he was spreading the word. He was spreading the gospel. And he said, thank God, because of my imprisonment, because I'm in jail, because I'm in this horrible situation, the gospel is being preached. The gospel is going forth. 
You might look at your situation today and you might think, oh, everything's against me. I'm in such a bad way. Everything seems to be uh, uh, going the wrong way. Realize that the situation you're in is because God has a place for you, a job for you, a ministry for you. He's got somebody there for you to tell about Jesus. Just open your mouth and let it out. So the Apostle Paul is writing this letter from the past to the future. And I feel like that's what's going on here today. Because we have a whole bunch of old Christians. When I say old, some of us are physically old, some of us are spiritually old. It means we've been walking with Jesus for a long time. Some of us have, have known God all of our lives. Some of us are just old both ways. We've known Jesus a long time and we're physically old. And, and we've had some life experiences. We've learned some things, mostly from the mistakes we made. And, and, some, and, and those things that we've learned, we need to pass on to a group of new people that are just now, God is just getting hold of your life and you're getting ready to explode. Yes. <laughs> That's what's going on here today in this very room. And and we need to learn from each other. Mm -hmm. yes. We need to grow from each other. Yeah. Yeah. Now here's the thing. I can't teach you what I know. Mm -hmm. I know that maybe sounds crazy, but I don't know what you don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know what you need. I don't know what to give you. So the only way you can learn from me is by sort of rub, rubbing up against me, by spending time with me, by hanging out, and, and, and by sort of uh, saturating yourself in the environment of this room. Because one of the things that's happening, and I've explained this before, but for those of you that maybe haven't heard this, there's an open portal in this room. I don't understand why it's here. I, I think it goes back to my grandfather and, and some different things, but there's a portal that heaven flows into this room. Yes. And one of the things that happens because of that open portal, and we experience it, uh, it, it right now we're experiencing it. The Spirit of God is, is like... He's, he's just mixing through this room. And it's like, a, it's like a big washing machine. It's just swirling around. And the Spirit of God, this swirling effect is taking place. It's taking the Spirit from these people, and it's just cycling it through these people. And, and it's just swirling around. And you need, to, you need to saturate yourself in this Spirit. You need to allow and open yourself to the Spirit of God that is flowing and moving through this room. Because God, God is getting ready to do something amazing. Yes. And you are the ones that He's going to do it through and do it with. Now there's other rooms, there's other places, there's, there's other groups like this, and they're scattered all over the country, and they're scattered all over the world. They're scattered in communist countries like China and places where, where you, you're not even allowed to speak the name of Jesus for fear of having your head cut off. Yeah. You're not even allowed to think the name of Jesus. If they knew you were thinking it, they would kill you. Yeah. And, and fortunately, we're not there yet. But there are groups, there are people like you, like me, like us, and they're scattered around. And what is happening is the Spirit of God is flowing yes. through the world. And He's getting ready to do something powerful and yes. something real. Yes. Open yourself to it today. Yes. Open yourself to it today. Do not be closed off. Yes. Do not tell God, I won't do it. Mm. Here's the deal. If you're going to be part of the solution, mm -hmm. if, if, you're, I mean, if you're not going to be part of the solution, you're going to become part of the problem. Mm. One of the things that's happening right now is, and, and I have to say this, I apologize to you younger ones because my generation dropped the ball. Yes. Forgive us. We dropped the ball. Forgive because us. Because what we did was we became really good at straddling the fence. Mm -hmm. The fence was wide. 
The fence was broad. You could build a house on that fence, and you could just camp up on that fence, and you didn't have to take a stand for anything. You could, you could have one foot in the world, and you could have one foot in Christianity, and you could just build a house and live there. And unfortunately, that's exactly what we did. You go into just about any city in the United States of America, and you will find a big church, a beautiful church. A church where they have beautiful music and, and, and a lot of people and they have uh, great choirs and they have great worship leaders and they have all kinds of things. And, and every city in the country, you'll find a church like that, big and small. Most of them have several of them. And all over the country are these great big churches that my generation built. And we were so excited about what God was doing because God was in building these big churches. But meanwhile, the world was going to hell around us. Amen. Meanwhile, we were killing and murdering 60 million babies. Come on. While we were building these great big churches and edifices to ourselves and to our names, the, 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 the real uh, work of God was not being done. The real edifice was the, being neglected. Yes. The real, the real name of Jesus. And, and we became really, really good at compromising. Mm -hmm. Because that's how we built these great big uh, monstrosities of ministries. And I'm not criticizing the men that built them. I'm just saying we did not get the job done. Mm -mm. Well, let me tell you something. That wall that we have lived on, that, 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 that fence... Dividing good from evil is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And it's going to become impossible to straddle That's that right. fence. That's it's right. going to become harder and harder to mm -hmm. sit on that fence. You are going to have to decide which side you're on. Mm -hmm. Because if you are not for God, you're yeah. going to be against yeah. him. Yeah. You yeah. will not be able to ride that fence very much longer. Right. Now, it looks like, to most people, like it's man that is initiating this narrowing of the fence. It looks like it's mankind that is sort of encroaching over into God's side and trying to steal territory. In actuality, in the truth of what's happening is, I believe, it's God that's narrowing the fence. Mm -hmm. yep. Amen. I believe it's God that's saying, yes. I am no longer going to accept fence straddlers. In the book of Revelation, it says this about people that are lukewarm. It says, I would rather that you were either hot or cold because lukewarm makes me sick. And I will spit you up. I will throw you up. I will regurgitate you. It says I will, in the King James, it says I will spew thee out of my mouth. That means that, 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 that lukewarm Christians make God sick. And I believe what's happening is we are living in the time when God has had it and he's fed up with lukewarm Christianity and he's getting ready and he's saying the fence is just getting too narrow to straddle anymore. The Apostle Paul was writing to the church at Philippi. He was writing to a group of Christians that that fence was paper thin. You couldn't straddle the fence there. And so he was writing to a group of Christians that were outnumbered, outgunned, outmanned, but they had truth. And he, was, he had planted a church, he had planted a group of believers right in one of the darkest places in the world. The same thing is happening today. Yes, yes. The light that God is planting, the light that God is igniting in you is going to spread through the world. Mm -hmm. And it's going to grow. And it's going to save a nation. It's going yes. to save a world. Yes. There are people that are going to be saved. They're going to be healed. They're going to be delivered because of the light that is being lit in you right now. Yes. Those are the people Paul was talking to. Mm. And one of the things Paul said in, in chapter 2, by the way, you could spend a lot of time in the book of Philippians. I'm just giving you 
a few points. I don't have time today to, to, to teach you the entire book of Philippians. You can read it and read it and read it and read it, and you will get so much out of it. I'm just pulling out a few bullet points to share with you today, some things that God has shared with me. So Paul was talking to this group of people. He was talking to us today. And he was saying, if you're going to succeed, if you're going to accomplish the mission that I have for you and what has been set out for you, if you're going to be the light in a dark place, he said, you're going to have to learn to get along. Mm -hmm. See, it's, it's not always easy for Christians to get along with each other. <laughs> Sometimes it almost seems impossible. Because Christians are people. And people have personalities. And personalities often clash with each other. I mean, I could go around the room right now and I could describe several different personalities that are sitting in this room. And it, it's a wonder that we can just sit here and smile at each other some days <laughs> with the different personalities. And there's, some of us are bold and aggressive and in your face. Others are more okay. quiet and shy and, yeah. and a lot more uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, reserved, reserved mm -hmm. subtle. Mm -hmm. Some of us are, are, are more likely to just want to pray for you. Others are going to, are, are going to want to stand up and stomp truth into you. Uh, there's all, all these different personalities. And what Paul was, Paul was realizing from prison, he was realizing he was talking to people. And he said, you're going to have to learn to get along. In order for you to fulfill the mission that God is giving you today, because right now God is He's drilling some stuff into some of your hearts right now. I can see it in your eyes. I can see what God is doing. And I can see the power of God resonating in you. And you're saying, yeah, that's me. That's me. Just let me out of here. And you're, you're, ready, to, you're ready to attack hell with a squirt gun. And, and uh, you're saying, let me go. But you're going to need some help. You're going to need some friends. You're going to need some backup. You're going to need somebody to be on your side. See, here's the thing. We don't fight the battle in here. The battle's out there. This is not where we fight. We come here and we come together to draw strength from each other, to draw encouragement from each other. From each other to, to get what you need from the person sitting next to you. Several months ago, I told you this that we're going to start having assigned seats, and we need to continue doing that. When you walk in here, you need to ask God, Where do you want me to sit today? You need to ask Holy Spirit, Who do you want me to sit today? Because the person sitting next to you has something that you need. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Now, when you walked in here, you didn't necessarily know what that was, you couldn't identify it, you couldn't. You couldn't uh, uh, spell it out. And you didn't even know you needed it. We need to get back to that. We need to be more intentional in our lives. We need to ask Holy Spirit every day, every minute of every day, where do you want me to go? Who do you yes. want me to talk to today? Yes. Who do you want me to sit next to? Yes. Who do you want me to fellowship with? Who do you want me to glom onto and get from them what they have for me today? Because that's what Paul was basically saying to the church at Philippi. He was saying, you need each other. You need to put your petty differences aside. You need to put your age differences aside. You need to put your gender differences aside. You need to put your racial differences aside. Whatever differences the world wants you to focus on it will, that will separate you, Paul was saying you need to put those aside and you need to come together in the Spirit of God. And that's what he was talking about when he said you need to have the same mindset that Jesus Christ had. Mm. Mm. He said, let this mind be in you, which was yes. in Christ Jesus. All yes. of that, that whole statement was all about getting along with each other and learning to, to, to uh, accept the differences and, and grow from each other's strengths. Mm. He said this, he said, in your, uh, and it's, it's verse 5, by the way, I, I'm horrible with the numbers. In your relationship with one another is what it says in the, in the NIV. Have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, 
talking about the mindset of Jesus, mm -hmm. Jesus who being in the very nature God, mm -hmm. so God's nature or his form, he was God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Mm -hmm. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. Mm -hmm. So this mindset, this, this uh, mind that was in Christ Jesus was the very mind that Jesus had when he left heaven where he was God and came down to earth and became a servant. Mm -hmm. Not only did he become a man, not only did he leave the form of God that he had and he took the form of man, but he took the lowest form of man. Mm -hmm. He didn't come. Think about this. Jesus, when he came to earth, if I was God, I would have come as a king. I would have come as a rule, a, a, a world leader. I mean, how else would it be better to evangelize the world and to, to spread a new truth? Because that's what Jesus did. He spread a new truth. Mm -hmm. His whole life was a transition from, from one thing to another. It was the salvation of mankind. If it would have been me, if I were God, I would have said, you know what? You can go be the, the president or the emperor or whatever, whoever it is that's in charge of Rome. Because that was the, the premier government of the day. Mm -hmm. And you would think that if God was going to activate and to do something great, he would, have, he would have sent his son Jesus and he said, I want you to go down there, Jesus, and I want you to take the, the, uh, become a man, but you just become the greatest man alive. Mm -hmm. You take on yourself a form of man, but you go down there and be the king. You be the emperor. You can set the law then. You can pass the mandate. You can say, this is how it's going to be. I'm Jesus. I'm here to save the world. And the whole world is going to bow down and knuckle under my authority because I'm coming in that form. No, that's not how he came. He came in the form of a servant. Yes. Not only was he not the king, he was a nobody. Why is it when our Savior set that example for us, for some reason we think, oh, I've got to build myself up so that I can accomplish what he has for me. Oh, come on. That's oh, oh, oh. Think about that. Hmm. Now, I know it's human nature. I know because I've done it. Oh, Jesus. Even, even today, I still do it. I, I could kick myself. Why is it I keep trying to build myself up, build myself? I'm always, I'm always telling God, God, you can use my strength. You can use whatever talents, abilities, every, every good thing I have, you're welcome to use. And God's saying, I don't need your strength. I don't need your talent. I don't need all of your good stuff. He's saying, I want your weakness. <laughs> See, it's not hard to give God our strength. No. That's an easy thing to do. Well, easy is a relative term. <coughs> it's not as hard mm -hmm. as giving God your weakness. Mm -hmm. But what I'm telling you today is God wants your weakness. Mm -hmm. It's mind-boggling, isn't it? Yeah. <coughs> Paul said Jesus not only quit being God and became man, but he became the lowest form of man. He was a servant. He took the nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And then it went from there and got even worse. It says, being found in appearance as a man... He humbled himself even farther by becoming obedient to death. Mm. Even death on a cross. See, here's the thing. We don't really fully, I don't think, grasp what the cross really was. We've sort of, uh, I, don't know, I, I don't know if we glorified it, but we, we sort of turned the cross into something that was a totally different thing than it was in Jesus' day when it actually happened. Amen. See, the cross was where the criminals were killed. 
The cross, in our day, we wear them around our neck. We make, we make statues out of it. I have one on my necklace here. It's a cross. Most everybody wears crosses. We have crosses all over the place. It's become, our, it's become sort of a symbol of Christianity. Mm -hmm. But back in the day when Jesus had to go to the cross, it meant something totally different. It meant disgrace, mm -hmm. humiliation. Mm -hmm. And Jesus had to humble himself to die on that cross. And that's what Paul was talking about when he said, let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. In order... For Jesus to accomplish what Jesus came to accomplish, he had to become nothing. Mm -hmm. And what God is saying to us today, believe it or not, because it, it's so counterintuitive to how we think. Mm -hmm. We think, oh, we're going to conquer the world. We're going to save the world. That means we need to build a base. We need mm -hmm. to build... Uh, like a, a, a platform to, to stand on. We need to have something. I need to take all the best parts of my personality and my strengths and I need to put together this, this uh, place where I can serve God from. And we're all willing to do that. But what Jesus said, no. He said, I humbled. I gave up all of my strength and became a servant and then went from being a servant to being a criminal. Mm -hmm. to being nothing, to being less than zero. Mm -hmm. Because it was there on that cross in abject humiliation, mm -hmm. naked and separated from his Holy Father, mm -hmm. that he gave himself mm -hmm. for me. Mm -hmm. And what God is saying to us today if we want to be part of the solution, you have to give up everything else. The price is steep. But let me tell you something. It's worth it. It's worth it. Because he goes on and he <clears throat> explains... The Apostle Paul said, because Jesus was willing to humble himself to that degree, God, in turn, made the name of Jesus the name above every name. The name that at some point, in some time in history, every knee would bow. Every tongue will someday confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Mm -hmm. And there will be a time when our Savior, our Jesus, will be the King of the world. He will be King. But before he could reach that point, he first had to humble himself. Mm -hmm. The Spirit of God is swirling through this room. Mm -hmm. Yes. Swirling through this room. And he is setting people's hearts on fire right now. He is lighting fire inside of people right now. The people that are going to change the world could be sitting in this, in this room right now. And the Spirit of God is just swirling around. And he's mixing us all up. And he's, he's mingling our spirits. And there's things you're going to learn from the people sitting next to you. But the only way you're going to know and to learn with the things you need to learn if you can put that mind and let the mind that was in Jesus be in you. Yes. Where you yes. become yes. nothing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nothing. John, the Baptist, the forerunner of Christ, said this. He said, he must increase. I must decrease. He must become greater. I must become less. You know what the smallest form of decrease you can be? Is nothing. Nothing. We have made the mistake of building huge, magnificent, 
wonderful ministries at the cost of the world dying around us. It's time for us to reverse that. Yes. I'm saying to you today, the Holy Spirit is saying to you today, I don't need you to be stronger. I don't need you to be smarter. I don't need you to be more talented. I don't need you to be more educated. I don't need you to have a better platform. I need you to be less. I need you to be nothing. I need you to subject yourself and to lower yourself and put yourself last so that the name of Jesus can be elevated, so that the work of God can go forth. God is calling us to nothingness. He's calling us to humble ourselves. Let this mind be in you, which is in Christ Jesus. I had two dreams this morning. And I, I, I hesitate to share these because I, I, but I feel like I should. And they both revolved around the same thing. I think I'm just going to share the second one with you. So I, I dreamed I was in a, it would have been a city probably like Las Vegas. And, uh, I was, I, we were, we were out to eat at a really nice restaurant, and it, it was a dream, so it wasn't, you know how dreams get, they're sort of, they're, they're like sort of convoluted, and in my dream, it wasn't me, and it wasn't Cindy, but I was in the dream, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. And the reason I say that is because I, it wasn't Cindy that I was with, and it wasn't me that was me. It was it was a it was a married couple, mm -hmm. and the the they were they were there in this in this fancy restaurant, and and uh, both of them are well dressed. She was beautiful. He was handsome, uh, good looking. Obviously, they had money. Obviously, they were well to do people, and. Uh, so they, they were having this meal together, and uh, another group came in, and in that group was uh, a friend of the wife that she had known in an in a earlier lifetime. And it became apparent that this woman had sort of been rescued by this man. He was a wealthy man, and he had taken this woman probably from the streets, and made her his wife. Put nice clothes on her and treated her well. And this other group came in, and, and there was a, a, it was like a party type of an atmosphere. And, and, and the, the, the wife recognized an old friend from a different life. It was a different lifestyle. And uh, when she saw this other group, they sat down, and the wife got up and went over. And became very intimate with this, with this friend from another lifestyle, from another lifetime. And the man, which was, it was sort of me, I, was, I, was, I remember I was sort of standing there, and the woman was just sort of abandoned him. And he was just sort of left there standing by himself with, with nothing to do. He, he, he didn't know, like, there was no place for him to sit. She had, 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 uh, was laughing and talking and having fun with her friends and was really, really joining in on what they were doing. And they really weren't doing anything wrong or, or, or like, sinful or anything like that. But they were just, it was a different group. And he obviously wasn't a part of it. And so he stood there, sort of on the outside looking in, watching this. And finally, she looked up at him, and she just sort of dismissively said, you can go sit over there and wait for me. I'll be done here in a little bit. Mm -hmm. And so the man said this. He said, that's okay. I'm going somewhere else. And he walked out of the room. He walked out of the situation. 
and as I was, as I, as, as him, I, whatever it was, as we were walking away, we were, in our mind, we were thinking, I need to call a divorce lawyer. I need to figure out how I'm going to eliminate this woman from my life. And I woke up at that point. And when I woke up, God told me, he said, I have that experience all the time. Oh. He said, people that I love, people that I gave my life for, people, people that I reached out and lifted them out of the pit, out of the misery, out of the despair, and I made them my bride. I made them my lover. I made them my friend. And I put clothes on their back, and I put jewelry on their fingers and on their ears and on their, around their necks, and I gave them everything. I gave them life. And he said, there's times and there's a time coming mm -hmm. when they choose to dismiss me, mm -hmm. to treat me like, you'll be there when I'm done playing around over here, so mm -hmm. you can just sit over here. Mm -hmm. And when I woke up this morning, I felt like what God was telling me God's grace, the well of God's grace, is endless. Mm -hmm. It never runs dry. Mm -hmm. It's deep. And it, it extends way beyond our ability to sin. Mm -hmm. But we need to understand something. Time is running out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's time that's running out. Mm -hmm. Not God's time, mm -hmm. our time. Mm -hmm. We cannot tell God anymore. You wait over there. Mm -hmm. I'll be with you in a minute. Mm -hmm. oh, wow. Folks, listen to me. God is calling you today. God is speaking to you today. Do not make the mistake of telling God one more time, I'll be with you as soon as I'm done doing what I want to do. Because time is running out. Mm -hmm. Not God's grace. Not God's mercy. It's almost infinite in its supply. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. I had that I had another dream that was different than that, but it had the same story in it for me. Mm. About rejecting God. Not rejecting Him. Not saying no to Him. Mm -hmm. Not saying, I don't believe in you. Not, not totally saying, I'm done with you. Mm -hmm. But just like a putting off. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, like I'll, I'll get to you when I'm done with my stuff. Mm -hmm. Folks, my generation did that. We sort of just kept putting God off. We, 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 we built our stuff. Mm -hmm. We built things in our name. Mm -hmm. And God is saying today, time is running out for that kind of stuff. I can say, what did you say? Time is running out for that kind of stuff. Father God, 